Live from New York, extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube, covering Spark Summit East, brought to you by Spark Summit. Now your hosts, Jeff Frick and George Gilbert. Hey, welcome back everybody. We are live in Midtown Manhattan at Spark Summit East 2016. Spark is the latest, newest, greatest thing in, uh, in big data. So we wanted to get out. It's our first Spark Summit. Actually, we did a little, uh, a little flyby last year, so we're excited to be really where the, the epicenter of big data shows is on the East Coast, the Hilton Midtown. And George uh, Gilbert from Wikibon is joining me for this next segment. Good to see you, George. And it's good to be here, and we have uh, one of the uh, new and giant entrance to the big data stage, um, SAP, in the form of Ken Tsai, who is um, VP of Data Management and Cloud Platform. Um, so, Ken, tell us a little bit about um, how SAP was among the first, if not the first, major vendor to the in-memory um, uh, transaction processing uh, database space, and then how the strategy evolved, the product strategy evolved to handle big data especially you know, what, what now people collect in Hadoop. Right, and I think that's a great, great question, great setting, and I think it will, the commentary will kind of illustrate really the need for, for a company who are kind of just specifically focusing on big data and also SAP, company like SAP who has been doing real-time enterprise for quite some time to work a lot more cohesively together. So, you know, SAP, as most people know, that we have been in, a, in the business of real-time business solution for the last 40 years. R3, the R stands for real time. Throughout the years, we kind of shifted through different, uh, I would say, data computing platform, all the way from mainframe to client server in the last 15 years um, into in-memory computing. And I would say that you know, with the entrance of the SAP HANA into the marketplace in five, five years ago, we have really kind of defined and shepherd the in-memory computing edge to the enterprise application, enterprise computing workflow. Right? And why HANA was created, and, and to kind of um, uh, dispel some of the prevailing notion. It was more than just accelerating analytics and putting in memory. You obviously can do that. And frankly, why SAP was innovating in this space for 15 years ago, was already doing that, right? We, we figure out a way to accelerate reporting by caching data directly in, in a data cache. Um, but what HANA was aimed to do was, was completely simplify a modern application architecture where some of the redundancies as application developers that we have to go through, we can completely eliminate, such as the need to build materialized aggregates, right? Now the system becomes interactive, and we can deliver new capabilities into the end user, built into ERP, that wasn't possible before. Let me just interrupt you for a second. Yeah. For our viewers um, who may not know um, the SAP, um, sort of schema, mm -hmm. just give us a refresher, actually for, these are, it's a database question, yeah. materialized aggregates and, and how much of, of the underpinning of SAP those form. Yeah. And I think this is not just uh, true within ERP, but if you take any information processing system, yeah. any enterprise that needs to go through, um, it's very typical, and I use this example in the keynote this morning, just post an invoice, right, whether you do an ERP or not, there is a, a interactions, right, you have to post a journal entry. Um, you have to typically, in an ERP system, and there is a aggregation and summarization of that invoice amount into different factors and dimensions that the company needs to report into. There's a summation and a total, that probably needs to be pre-calculated because as financial accountant, you want to know what it is. There's the index and there's the different search term. There's a lot of different back-end um, uh, processing that needs to happen to make the system interactive. SAP ERP was built that way, right? It was architected that way because the latency involved in pulling the data and doing it on the fly was too long, right? And enter HANA, right? And HANA, and the example I show, we were able to reduce the number of tables that touches the invoice from 15 all the way down to four because these just keep the rawest form of information. And then, then you leverage the power in memory computing like HANA to dynamically create the summarization view that you want to see, right? And that's kind of the where we suffer into the, the, what I call the edge, the age of the real-time computing, right? The true so, real, real. So as you said, R3 and R2 were meant to be real-time system two and real-time system three. Yeah. Tell us, beyond just summarizing like a, an invoice or whatever, mm -hmm. tell us what's possible 
now when you don't have to sort of pre-compute things, yeah. but that you know, when you uh, make a transaction, you can ask questions interactively, what's possible? Yeah, so I think one of the holy grail and as business owner always wanted to do is do simulation, right? The ability of asking multiple what if, and then settle on what actually is the most optimal scenario I want to do. Like take a simulation of forecast. What is my revenue forecast, right? What is actually projected revenue? When I close my book right now, based on real-time data, can I actually have multiple versions of these forecasts based on the way I want to organize my company or organize my data structure. Okay. These, you can take that example and multiply in different line of business, right? That's kind of the really the possibility of, of what um, what, what a real-time business should be able to deliver. And we have been hampered by, by really um, uh, in our ability to tap into what, um, what the computing infrastructure and what the software infrastructure platform was able to deliver. So HANA kind of solved that. We kind of simplified it, we changed the game with that. And that's why HANA has been so successful in the marketplace for five years, right? But maybe to your original questions, uh, why didn't we stop there, right? Why didn't we put HANA and use it for big data? And we do, right? HANA is a multi-data um, multi uh, processing engine, right? Can support unstructured data, natural language processing, all the different things. But the reality of what the customer are facing today is big data is everywhere and not one large cluster, right? The cons are the days of putting every single centralized I understand everything and I, I give the results that, or understanding the, the big data signal that I can take action on. Now, with uh, advance of the IoT, let's say advance of digital business where everything that a company offer can be a service. Uh, we call it everything as a service, right? Uh -huh. Now, everything involving that, that process is uh, digitized in some sort of data form. You have to track it, you not need to understand it. And that's why big data is literally around everywhere multiple way of managing these type of, um, of large data clusters. And so from the data processing point of view, and what needs to happen is we need to help the business establish what we call a very easy to use data end-to-end -to -end data processing framework across multiple of these computing landscapes. Whether you're running enterprise computing workload like S4 HANA ERP, or massively distributed computing workload like uh, just a data lake that you want to do some data exploration. You should have a framework that actually connect that together. And that's kind of really the reason why SAP HANA Bora was born and why we launched the product. Right? We saw the need in this area and we wanted to actively work with the community and kind of bridge these two worlds together, the distributed computing world and the enterprise computing world. I think, I think, Ken, you can address, you know, as a big incumbent, you guys have ERPs all over the place, you've got a lot of the core data, right, that everybody wants to get access to. But on the yep. other hand, you know, as an incumbent, you're, you have that legacy. Mm -hmm. Talk about the change, really, in strategy inside of SAP to deliver value to your customers as, you know, the, the sources of data, the sources of input have gone beyond what was really a kind of a closed ERP system, and now they want to aggregate all kinds of stuff that falls outside of what traditionally was, was held inside of a controlled system. Yeah, so one of the statistics that I think SAP internally says that you know 74% of the world's transaction revenue run through a SAP system in some way, right? It does mean that a lot of transactions that touch money, right? Revenue, costs, anything. Uh, there's a lot of value in terms of exposing that into other workload, right? Uh, whether data science, exploratory workload, or other way to consume that. And, and in this day and age where business are being digitized, right, and every element of the business processes should be available as a services, SAP needs to um, has, stands in the position to actually offer that, right, more broadly to the entire customer uh, and their, their business network. And I think that's kind of the reflect your original question, the change of strategy. This is absolutely critical for, for SAP to help us customers successful that we want to expose the, the ERP system. Um, now running completely in HANA, right? That all the information around the business, core business processes can be exposed as, a, let's say, a service element that someone can consume, interact with. So let's talk about now all <clears throat> the data that might surround the core business system but mm -hmm. beyond SAP um, and how Vora mm -hmm. um, helps access that data and then tie it into the 
you know, back to Spark where mm -hmm. we have this new unified um, sort of compute engine mm -hmm. for, for processing data in sort of any and all um, uh, uh, frameworks. Yeah. Um, how does that all fit together? So um, um, just take the, one of the customer examples that we have. I think that will illustrate this, this need very clearly. Right? So one of the use cases that we're currently working for SAP Halavora is in the airline industries where they invested in all these tel telemet telemetry information directly in the plane itself. Right? And the whole idea was kind of reading these telemetry information and understanding uh, the insights of it, understand the threshold of it, and you can actually determine a preventive maintenance schedule. But what the customer actually wanted to do is go way, move way beyond that because that only gives you a signal in terms of what needs to be done. What actually is, uh, has a, a direct financial cost is can you actually take that early signal and put it in what we call the MRO process, in the ERP, maintenance, repair, and overall. Because you have to line up all the experts who can maintain their airplane, right? Line up the spare part, line up the equipment, all that takes the scheduling process. And now you're kind of taking uh, big data inside make it very actionable in the process itself, right? And uh. to the airlines, there's a very direct financial impact because to them, every hour of delay represents $10,000 cost, right? So now, you see the value of some of these big data insights move, in, you know, rather than kind of staying in one silo. When it's embedded into the core business process, what a company runs, now you're actually getting some very direct benefit. Well, I was going to say, and just the whole yeah. internet of things, you guys yeah. must be so excited to have this completely different set of data inputs now, mm -hmm. uh, tangential to the, the core business applications that can now drive business behavior, business decisions, and tie it directly back to financial impact. Yes, and I think that that we're definitely in the golden age of, uh, of data, right? Where data is the, the currency of everything. Data doesn't come from transaction system anymore, it can come from products, right? And user interacting with the product, from sensor information that, in, that we sell directly to the customers, right? And the customer and the partner, how they feedback, even potentially from social media that understanding and tapping into the richness of it and taking that and embed it into the, the business process that we eventually want to deliver. Really is the, the, the vision that we, what we're trying to deliver. How many are, uh, um, integration points are there like done and then on the roadmap for things like taking predictive maintenance and putting it, embedding it in the MRO mm -hmm. workflow? That's an amazing example. Um, yeah, so, um, I, I think you're asking about some of the specific use cases where we can apply this type of technology, bring, let's yeah. say, ERP data and these amazing uh, surrounding contextual information, right, to enrich uh, um, the, the entire decision-making process. Right. Um, and our hope is to make, you know, help the business owner make better decision and also potentially to automate the process underneath. Right. So decision can be made automatically. Now, uh, we are definitely in the process of defining a lot of these different use cases, and you know that in SAP we have very deep industry knowledge across 25 industries in line of business, right? So literally in every single industry we have a concerted effort defining what we are doing in those industries to bring the value of, I, we call it, you know, completely um, distributed big data that you collect either from IoT or from any other source, married with the corporate data and the business data, and then you uh, clean the right insight and you automate, uh, take um, the business process transaction. Do you have, um, is there like a roadmap of like, well we have a dozen now, we're going to have two dozen over the next, two dozen more over the next you know, year and. Yeah, that's a good question. Right now we don't have one, but maybe it's something that we have to internally think through, right? What we have done on the roadmap side is more on uh, delivering horizontal capability roadmap, right? As uh, we want to aggressively uh, build out the capability of SAP HANA Bora to kind of really fulfill the vision of the complete digital enterprise for our customers. That's, that's very, very critical. And there is very, I would say right now, very IT specific type of scenarios that we see the application of, uh, of Bora, right? And with writing on Apache Spark and working in conjunction with HANA. Right? Tell, tell us the Spark tie-in. Is, is Spark the preferred sort of execution engine on top of Vora? I think really due to the adoption and maturity of Apache Spark, as you can see in today's event, it is definitely the, 
the execution engine that Wara actually leverages to, to do distributed computing. Now, who knows what the future will hold? This is a very rapidly evolving area. Um, and so Vora talks to Spark, which talks to, which talks to Hadoop? Yes. Is that how? Okay. Yeah, in a kind of logical type of thinking, that, that, that is uh, the way to think of it. But Vora itself is a memory computing engine, right? It took the best of what SAP HANA had to offer. Um, really, the very, very, we, what we wanted to do was very simply, Vora, the promise of Vora was to deliver this whole HANA-like experience, right? But on the big data set, um, but also give it real strong, deep business and tech understanding. So that when you actually harvest these like uh, data that may be on structure or sensor information, that there is a rationalization for the business audience to take some action on it. That's really the purpose of why Vora is there. Now, there is always going to be foundational component technology like Apache Spark, who has been really great and then really kind of solving a lot of, I would say, uh, distributed query uh, processing workloads. We'll continue to ride that wave and continue to make it more robust, but we'll, um, just like Bora did in version one, we have been really aggressively adding capability that the core business audience actually need, that are just missing in Spark environment as an extension. That's why we plug into the Spark environment and we try to make it more robust for our enterprise workload. So we're in the platform hardening m mode mm -hmm. before we get into the vertical applications. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well yeah. that's great. Well Ken, unfortunately we're out of time, but uh, you know, a lot of excitement happening at SAP, leveraging these new technologies, leveraging open source, you know, kind of opening up, uh, which you guys have so much of the, the <laughs> core information with really a different way of looking at the world as well as being able to bring in a whole new set of information to yes. drive your engines. Yeah, I think so. I think this is definitely an exciting time, not just for SAP. We certainly, um, um, we are a very major participant, right? Just because the, the workload and the solution set that we, we deliver to, the, um, to all our customers. But I like to tell the community here, all the, also the people here, right? Collectively, these are our joint customers. Uh, the way that we are solving um, jointly for our customer is the next generation problem. How to actually build a foundational data processing framework that will be massively distributed across multiple different computing clusters. How do we deliver that insight to the customer that they take business action? That will not change. Awesome. Right? It's up for us to figure out how to do it. All about solutions, right? It's all yes. about solving business problems. Talk about tech, George likes to talk about tech, but at the end of the day, are we solving business problems? So, Ken, again, thanks for stopping by theCUBE. I'm Jeff Frick with George Gilbert. We are live in Midtown Manhattan at Spark Summit East. We'll be back with our next segment after this short break. Thanks for watching.